Hello, I'm Mr. Eck and you're watching EckMath. Today, we are going to talk about factoring. This first video is going to be the basics of factoring, kind of the most important things. We're going to start from the beginning and work up to some tricky problems. Uh, and then we'll do another couple videos about some of the more advanced factoring techniques. So the first thing that I want to uh, talk about with factoring is greatest common factors. Um, greatest common factors are uh, things that are shared across all terms. Uh, in this expression, there are two different types of greatest common factors. There are numerical greatest common factors, oh, and there are greatest common factors that involve an S. In the numerical part, I noticed that 6 is a common factor of 6, 18, and 12. So I'm going to factor out that greatest common factor of 6. Now looking at the x terms, I have an x to the fourth, an x to the third, and then x squared. The greatest common factor that's shared across x to the fourth, three, and two is x squared. So I'm going to write a 6x squared factored out. And then we figure out what goes inside. One way, and this is I'm saying this now because you're going to want to know it later, one way to think about how you figure out what goes inside these parentheses is you're kind of dividing the uh, original by the thing you factored out and that tells you what is left over. Uh, so if I take out a 6 and I take out an x squared, I have an x squared left. Here if I take out a 6x squared, I'm writing it like division because I'm just pulling it out. I should get 3x. If I take out a 6x squared out of 12x squared, you'll get Good old two. And so that's how this factors out. Now I do want to add one thing, uh, which is that if the problem just said factor out the greatest common factor, you would be done and you could box this answer. But a lot of times the problems will say something like factor completely. And completely is a really important word in that sentence. Uh, completely means until all your factors are degree 1 or prime. Prime, in this case, means something that you cannot factor. So 6x squared is not degree 1, but it is prime because there's no more factoring that you can do. You've already pulled that out. But x squared minus 3x minus uh, plus 2 does actually factor into x minus 2 and x minus 1, which you can check if you would like. And if this problem said factor completely, you should 100% be sure that you're factoring all the way to the most complete factored form. This is the form that will tell you, for example, where the zeros of the graph are. So like if I'm looking at this form, I can't tell where the zeros of the graph are. If I'm looking at this form, I could tell that the graph crosses the x-axis at 0, 1, and 2. And so it would have to look something like, uh, I think this graph would look something like that. It would be a polynomial graph. Um, we'll talk more about that later, but that's the importance of factoring completely. In this next problem, I want to talk about factoring the greatest common factor out again, but this one's a little different. Uh, it's already sort of like halfway factored, I guess, is how I would express this. Um, what sometimes students will do is they'll say, oh, well, I can't have that. I'm going to multiply this back in. That's a mistake. That's like not helpful or productive. Uh, what I want you to identify is that in this expression, I'm going to put some big parentheses around it. I have some things that are different, but I also have some things that are the same. That 2x plus 1 is a greatest common factor because it is a factor, it's multiplied in both terms. So it is possible to take that greatest common factor and factor it out. Uh, you can factor it out to the left or to the right. It doesn't actually matter. Um, I'm going to factor it out to the left. And then I have to say, okay, well, what's remaining? Well, if, let me make these different color. If in those parentheses I'm taking out a 2x plus 1, then what's left in the parentheses? An x and a 4. And so this should have factored into 2x plus 1 times uh, x plus 4 quantity. And that's important, not really for any particular problem. Not very many problems come to you this way. But this is a step in a procedure called factoring by grouping. And the greatest common factors are why this next thing we're going to about to do, uh, why that works. 
Uh, now we're going to talk about factoring by grouping, which is one of my favorite factoring techniques. Um, it's really useful. It's, it's useful in a lot of places. Here's how it goes. Uh, so I have this four-term cubic. Often you'll do grouping on a cubic. You don't have to, but it's very nice to do. What you do is you take the first two terms and group them up with a set of parentheses. And you take the last two terms and group them up with a set of parentheses. Now I'm going to do something a little special here because that third term was negative. What I'm going to do is group the negative inside the parens and add a plus in between those terms uh, to kind of keep things the same, but make sure the negative is grouped properly. You'll see why that's important when, I, when we finish the problem. Uh, so then what you do is within each set of parens, you factor out the greatest common factor. So this has a greatest common factor of x squared, and you would be left with x plus 6. Then copy down the plus sign, and then this next term in yellow has a greatest common factor of negative 2. And if you factor out a negative 2 from each of these terms, the 2x and the 12, you get an x plus 6. And what you now notice, or I hope you now notice, is that we're in a situation like the previous problem, where I have a large expression with a greatest common factor that happens to be x plus 6. So you can factor out that x plus 6 and write it like this, x plus 6 times well, whatever's left oh, in, the, in the, the brackets, which would have been x squared minus 2. You can confirm that that worked by multiplying this all back out, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you multiply that out, you get x cubed minus 2x plus 6x squared minus 12. Is that the original? Sure is. So this turns out that it actually is factored uh, nicely. Uh, one thing that some of you might notice, you might say, Mr. X, is this factored fully? I see an x squared there. Yeah, but 2 is prime, so you're not going to be able to divide that further. Technically, if you really want to be pedantic, you could do x plus 6 uh, times x plus root 2, x minus root 2, because any number is a perfect square if you accept square roots, and so you could do that, uh, but I'll say that that's optional. Um, and I would factor it like this. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's how you do factoring by grouping on a cubic. One more sidebar about this. You can actually switch the order. So say you didn't want to deal with that negative 2. Uh, you could flip-flop the negative 2 and the 6x squared, and it would still group out in the same way. So you would have an x times an x squared minus 2 plus a, now you have a 6 that comes out, and an x squared minus 2. And so you factor it into x plus 6, x squared minus 2. Same as before. And that's actually a really nice way if you want to check your answer. I actually did this problem uh, five minutes ago, got different answers for each way, and I knew that I made a mistake, and I was able to find that mistake and fix it. Uh, and I want to add that that switching the order, it's not special to this problem. That's, that should work for anything that factors by grouping. If you switch the order, it will still factor by grouping. And that's going to be really nice with quadratics, where you're actually creating the middle terms. Uh, so it, it's kind of useful to know that either order works. Speaking of quadratics, uh, let's talk about them. So quadratics are the main thing that you factor. And probably when you think about factoring, whether you have good feelings or bad feelings about factoring, you're probably thinking about factoring quadratics. So uh, some notation. Quadratics are things of degree 2. Often we write them in factored or multiplied form or polynomial form as ax squared plus bx plus c. I'm going to use little a, b, and c for the coefficients of that, that multiplied form. And if you were to factor that out into two degree 1 monomials, or uh, binomials, sorry, two degree one binomials, uh, those would have coefficients. I'm going to call the coefficients big A, big B, big C, and big D, uh, just to keep things straight, but to, to make those comparisons. The first type of quadratic factoring you'll probably see is uh, things where the coefficient on X is one. So uh, you have you know, X plus B, X plus D, uh, or in this specific example, you know, x squared plus blah, blah, blah. So there's just a 1x squared, which is uh, really nice. That's the main situation of factoring. Here's how I approach these. First, I'm going to do the general form. 
So if I were to multiply this out, I would get x squared plus dx plus bx plus bd. And then I could actually group the middle terms. I'm going to do that. Uh, so it could be x squared plus d plus b x plus bd. And what this means, or you know, to boil this down into more useful language, is that the factors of little c, the last term, need to add up to little b, the middle term coefficient. Uh, and why is that true? Well, because uh, you can see this algebra. That's why it's true. So when you're factoring something like this, what you're going to do, you've probably done this before, is look for factors of 45. 45 and 1, no. Uh, well, what you're checking is do they add to negative 14? So I guess negative 45 and negative 1, so if you have a negative uh, middle term, you're going to need both factors to be negative. Um, if both are negative and you're positive, that's how you get that negative. Uh, negative 45 and 1, no. Let's jump to something in the middle. How about uh, 9 and 5? Negative 9, negative 5. Do those add to negative 14? Yes, they do. So you could check different factors, of course, but uh, usually you can get a pretty good guess just by looking at the, the size of the numbers. Uh, so what does that mean for factoring? It means that you now know what d and b are. So when I factor this out, I can write it as x minus 9, x minus 5, and be pretty confident that it will work. You can multiply those back together. I always like to do that, kind of multiply them back together in my head, just to make sure that the factoring was correct. If you're doing a really involved problem where the first step is factoring, it really, really stinks to factor the first step wrong because then the whole problem is usually harder. Uh, so it's really good to check that factoring every time you do it. Let's keep going into the realm of more complicated factoring. So here I'm going to uh, throw some coefficients on the x term. So I'm going to put that a and c back in. Let's multiply this uh, general form out before we start factoring the actual example. Uh, so this would be ac x squared plus a d x plus b c x plus b d. And then I guess I could do that one more step just like before. So a c x squared plus a d plus b c x, kind of like greatest common factor just within the middle, plus b d. Uh, now that's actually really important, but I'm going to leave it for one moment. Um, and then talk about this guy. So how would you factor this? Well, what I like to do uh, when I see something like this, where it, it has a coefficient, but it doesn't actually look too bad. And what makes this look easy to me is that 3, 2, and 5 are all prime. So that basically means that I'm, I'm not going to have too many particular choices. So what I'm going to try to do is just guess what are a, b, c, and d. Well, the factors that make the coefficient on x have to go to 3, right? So I have to have a 3 has to be like a times c. So I could have 3x and 1x. And that's actually about it. I could have 3x and 1x, I could have 1x and 3x, but there's no other factors of 3. So I know that already. Uh, and this is where you can kind of start to, hey, I'm guessing checking. I'm working out my factors. OK. Uh, well, then I need to put a 5 in here, right? The factors of 5 are, well, negative 5, are negative 5 and 1, or negative 1 and 5. And so I have four things I need to check. 3x plus 1 times x minus 5, 3x uh, minus 5, we'll switch those, and then x plus 1, 3x, uh, what am I going to do, minus 1 and x plus 5, 
and 3x must be plus 5, x minus 1. Those are the possibilities for this. And this is where factoring gets really tedious, and I think a lot of people sort of give up or say, oh, I hate factoring, I'm no good at it. Of those possibilities, if you're just guessing checking, you just have to test them out, each one. Um, and what are you testing? You're testing for when you multiply them, do you get the proper middle term? So when you're guessing checking, you're sort of setting it up so that you get the correct first term and the correct last term, and then you're trying to make that middle term work out. There are better methods for this, but when something is small, like right, three, two, five, I do kind of just like to guess and check if I'm being honest with you. All right, so let's multiply these out. So this would be three x squared minus 15 x plus x minus 5. That's not going to work because I'm looking for minus 2x. Okay, what about the next term? Uh, so on all of them, I know I'm going to get a 3x squared and a minus 5 because that's how I set it up. So I really only need to look at uh, the middle term AD and BC. So here I would have a 3x minus 5x minus 5. Oh, this is it! Because it would be 3x squared minus 2x minus 5. So by guess and checking, and I've gotten lucky because it was in the second guess, I've solved the problem. This is the correct factored form. How do I know? Because it multiplies back to give me the proper original. I went ahead and multiplied out the last two just to see if there was any, there shouldn't be any duplicates, but just to see and make sure that those didn't work. Uh, and this one really doesn't work. It gives me negative 14x. And this one almost works, but it gives me positive 2x. So if you're guessing, checking, and you see, oh, I got the right thing with the wrong sign, consider just flipping the signs of your guess. Now, I'm actually kind of a big proponent of guess and check because it's something you can always do, right? You, you, you know what you're doing. I'm going to set out, I'm going to write some parentheses and just start filling them in and see what works. But sometimes you get problems that are just too ridiculous. So like if I was going to guess and check on here, I would have to set up, you know, my two factors. I would be looking, I need to have the x term. And I could have, of course, 6x and 1x, but couldn't I also have 2x and 3x? And I guess, couldn't I have 3x and 2x? So I don't really know which of those goes. And then I have 12. 12, even though it's positive, has a lot of factors. It's, it's right, it's 3 and 4. It's 12 and 1. It's 2 and 6. So I'm going to have a lot of different things that I have to guess and check. And that just sounds bad. So it's good news that there's another way to approach this. I call this the AC grouping method, and this is how I'm going to factor this. This, by the way, is equivalent to the like X factoring method, where you like put the different coefficients in uh, different places on a cross. If you saw that in, in another math class, um, it's equivalent to this. Uh, and the way it works is as follows. It's called AC grouping method because what do you first do? Uh, step one is you multiply little a times little c. So I'm going to multiply 6 times 12 and get uh, 72. Then step 2, you're going to look for factors of ac, in this case 72, that add, what is, how do you spell that? Not like that, add to little b, in this case negative 17. So I need some factors of 72 that add to negative 17. So then I go over on the side and I just write 72 on top and I start listing its factors um, because 72 is positive, but the uh, sum has to be negative. Both factors have to be negative. So like negative one and negative 72 does not add to negative 17. Um, you know, what are some other factors of 72? I know it's divisible by six. What, how about 12, right? It's six times 12. How about negative 6 and negative 12? Those add to negative 17. Uh, no, those add to negative 18. So I need to keep going. Well, I remember that 8 times 9 is 72. 
Uh, so how about negative 8 and negative 9? Does that add to negative 17? Yes, it does. And that's what I want then. So that, that's going to be my chosen factorization. Um, so then what I do with that is I'm going to take that negative 17x and write it as follows. 6x squared minus 8x minus 9x plus 12. So I take this negative 17x and I break it into two pieces. Why would I do that? Well, because I now have four terms. And if you have four terms, you can group them. Uh, so I'm going to write this as 6x squared minus 8x paren plus minus 9x plus 12. Remember to group that minus inside a paren. Uh, so I'm writing my steps here. Hold up. Three. Uh, group split B up and four factor by grouping. Okay, now back to the factor. Uh, so I have 6x squared, so an x is going to come out, and it looks like maybe a 2 is all that comes out. So then you'll get 3x minus 4. That seems right. And then here, a negative something will come out. Uh, how about a negative 3 can come out? And if I pull out a negative 3, then I'll have a 3x minus 4 also. Mm. Make a line, split the list up from the problems. Okay, this is good, by the way. Whenever you identify a common term, then you know your grouping has succeeded. Okay, so let's finish the factor. This is going to factor into 2x minus 3. That is everything that was left and everything that was common or grouped down. How could you check this? Well, I don't know, multiply it back together. So this would give you 6x squared minus 8x, uh, minus 9x, plus 12. Does that add to the original? Yes, it does. So that's how you check your work. That is factoring by grouping uh, using the AC ungrouping method. By the way, just like with all other grouping, if you switch the 8 and the 9, so you had the 9 here and the 8 there, it would still work. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you. Um, and actually, I'd encourage you, right, pause the video, and uh, try it out with the 8 and 9 switched, you should get the same things. And if you don't, uh, then you should check your work. Theory time. Here's why that works. Um, you don't need to like know why that works You know, every moment of every day, but I like knowing why it works because it kind of helps me remember it and be more okay with it. Um, and the way that it works, or the reason it works, is going back to what we did before with the generic polynomial, a, uh, ax plus b and cx plus d. If you multiply that out, you got um, ACX squared plus AD plus BCX plus BD. Uh, and that was kind of like our AX squared plus BX plus C. So when I multiply A times C in the gen little a times little c, what I'm really doing is AC times BD, which gives me ABCD. And what I end up doing then is I'm looking for factors of A, B, C, D that add to A, D plus B, C. And that's why this works, is that when I multiply the first and the last term, I end up with all four possibilities kind of multiplied together. And then when I start factoring this out, right, so I'm saying, okay, what is the factors out? Well. You know, you could have A, B, C, D, you could have A, C, B, D, you could have A, D, B, C, right? And so you're listing those out, and eventually, you're eventually going to list, even though you don't know what A, B, C, and D were, you're eventually going to find one that adds up to A, D plus B, C, because it's just made of the same four letters, or, or uh, not letters, but, but mystery numbers. And that's why it functions. Let's do another example. So, you know, people uh, can be uncomfortable with that. So it just helps to do more examples. If you feel real comfortable with this, you can skip this example and go uh, on to the next problem after this. All right. So I'm first going to compute AC. 
which is 9 times minus 4, which is negative uh, 36. I'm going to look for factors of negative 36 that add to positive 5. Okay, so I'll write negative 36 here. Now let me think about the positive negative for a second because my factors have to, my uh, multiplication is negative. I need a negative factor and a positive factor. So like negative 1 and 36 or negative 36 and 1. I have to check both possibilities. Those don't work, by the way. Um, let's see. Well, how about 9 and 4? Right, so I, I guess I could try 6 and 6, but those add to 0, so that's not going to work. Um, but 9 and 4 would work if the 4 was negative, So uh, because that's equal to 5, which I wanted. So then I can write this as 9x squared plus 9x minus 4x minus 4. Oh, and I can already see how beautifully this is going to line up. Uh, so when we pull out, let's do our grouping. Remember to group the negative with the second term. So I'll have a 9x, x plus 1, plus negative 4, x plus 1. And we get 9x minus 4, x plus 1. Done and factored. Let's check our work. 9x squared plus 9x minus 4x minus 4. Uh, 9 minus 4 is plus 5x. So it did work out. It multiplies back together. Uh, and so that's another example of using this factor by grouping. This one came out so simply, I probably could have guessed and checked it. But honestly, you know, at some point, the AC grouping method is, is kind of easier. So I will say this. I use that AC grouping whenever I see a coefficient that's not equal to 1, right? If I see that 9 out there or even a 2, I'll go ahead and use the AC grouping. What I do catch people doing, though, is using AC grouping like this on problems like uh, x squared plus 2x plus 1. And that's where I really kind of wonder about you. Like, sure, go ahead, do it. But do you really need to go through that whole procedure when you could probably guess and check it just as fast? So I think it's really important for you to be prepared with multiple methods of factoring and not just rely on a single tool. That said, if you rely just on guess and check, you're going to be in a real trouble sometimes in certain problems. We are almost done with part one here, but there's one last thing we have to talk about, which is special factoring patterns. The first one is difference of squares. So difference of squares is uh, if you have something like big A squared minus big B squared, that will always, always, always factor into a plus b times a minus b every single time. And if you don't believe me, what I would want you to do is multiply that back out. And what you'll notice is the middle terms, you get an ab and then a minus ba, and it cancels out. And so you end up with an a squared minus b squared. So if you see a binomial, right, so a squared minus b squared has two terms, where each term is a perfect square, and you have subtraction, hence the word difference, you can use this factoring pattern to avoid all sorts of terrible effort in tearing your hair out. Uh, so in this case, I recognize that 36 is a perfect square, 49 is a perfect square, and x and y are perfect squares. You can do this, by the way, with a y. I know we've usually been using x, but you can have different variables or multiple variables in here. Same thing. And how does this go? Well, I like to identify a and b. So here it looks like my a is 6x, right? Because like this whole thing has to be an a squared, and this whole thing has to be a b squared. So it looks like my b should be 7y. And then uh, when you're looking, identifying a and b, in difference of squares, the negative does not get built in to the a and a or the b. The negative is part of the factoring pattern. That's going to show up when you write out the terms. Uh, so if it's the pattern is a plus b, a minus b, then this should factor into 6x plus 7y and 6x minus 7y. So the uh, minus comes in when you do the second term that has a negative. Uh, you can check your work, multiply it back out, you should get 36, uh, 
times 36x squared uh, minus 42xy plus 42xy. Oh, they cancel out. Minus 49y squared. So it does work out. That's difference of squares factoring. I think that's the most important factoring pattern that you could possibly recognize. It shows up all the time. We talked about this in the last video, too. Put a big rainbow star next to this factoring pattern if you're going to learn one thing this year. I think learning difference of squares factoring would be a really good uh, item on that list. Let's do another example. Uh, 81x to the fourth minus 1. You're like, Mr. Eck, Mr. Eck, you can't fool me. That's not a perfect square. It's a fourth power. Yes, but guess what? x to the fourth is really x squared squared. So guess what? This is a difference of squares. I'm also going to add in here a little a hint or direction. This problem would probably tell you to factor completely. Only because all problems will tell you to do that, but uh, we're going to see what happens here. All right, so difference of squares, huh? So then my a is 9, the square root of 81, x squared, and my b is 1, right? Because 1 is 1 squared, so 1 is also a perfect square. Oh, that's very nice. Okay, so then this should factor into 9x squared plus 1 times 9x squared minus 1. Ah, okay, done, right? Or are we? Because what you'll notice is that this guy is also a difference of squares pattern, right? We have a square, a square, a square, and a subtraction. So, well, the first term cannot be factored further because it has that plus sign. The second term can be factored into 3x minus, uh, we'll do plus first, 3x plus 1, 3x minus 1. So be sure if you see something that says factor completely, even if you're really excited about cool factoring patterns, you know, it's really easy to be to get distracted, make sure you actually factor things completely uh, all the way down. Finally, the last factoring pattern is perfect square factoring. This is something you're probably familiar with and, and pretty good at recognizing when the leading coefficient is 1, but maybe not when the leading coefficient is not 1. So if you have something like ax plus b quantity squared, remember what that is, is ax plus b times itself, which factors into, uh, or mul sorry, multiplies together into a squared x squared plus abx plus abx plus b squared, uh, or a squared, or maybe I should write it as ax squared plus 2abx plus b squared. So, what this says is when you're looking at something and you're trying to factor it, and it's got three terms, so you can't do difference of squares, but it still has that like perfect squariness, right? 64 and x squared and 1 are all perfect squares. You should at least try, it might not always work because it does depend on the middle term, but you should at least try a perfect square factorization. So could this factor into 8x uh, now this has to be minus 1 because I have a minus 16 times 8x minus 1. Let's double check. 64x squared minus 8x minus 8x uh, plus 1. Yes. So that's an example of a perfect square factoring pattern where the leading coefficient is not 1. And just whenever you see, to uh, so kind of zoom out and do a big picture, Whenever you see in the thing that's asking you to factor perfect square numbers, 36, 49, 81, 64, anytime you see those, you should be looking at either perfect square factoring or difference of squares factoring. Won't always work, uh, but when it does, it's really nice. And then the last thing to watch out for is don't get too excited. There's no such thing as sum of squares. 
So like a squared plus b squared doesn't, doesn't factor out at all. Um, so that was like the 9x squared plus 1. You have no choice but to leave it. That happens to be uh, perfectly prime. All right, folks, thanks for sticking with me for so long. Factoring is a really challenging topic that a lot of people struggle with. The prescription for factoring problems, though, is just practice. Um, one other suggestion I have is that if you're really struggling with factoring, you're like, I, I just can't see it. I'm not sure where things go. I would actually recommend you go back a section and really practice multiplying polynomials because factoring is just reverse multiplying. So if you're really struggling with factoring, really strongly consider uh, going back to multiply some stuff together, and then it will actually make it easier to take it apart. Just like many things, if you could put something together, it's much easier to take it apart again. Um, stay tuned for the next video where we'll talk about some advanced factoring techniques that are uh, more difficult but also very useful. Thank you all for watching. Let me know what questions you have, and I'll see you all next time.